नमस्कार गुड इवनिंग एवरीवन वेलकम टू द फिनाले लेक्चर ऑफ दिस अर्थ साइंस वीक वेयर वी हैव एम्प्रेस्ड ऑन इनक्रेडिबल जर्नी सेलिब्रेटिंग अवर प्लैनेट टू द कैप्टिवेटिंग वर्ल्ड ऑफ फिलेटली व्हिच इज एक्चुअली अ ग्राउंड ब्रेकिंग इवेंट जॉइंटली ऑर्गेनाइज्ड बाय फोर प्रोमिनेंट इंस्टीट्यूशंस महाराष्ट्र वृक्ष संवर्धिनी पुणे द अप्लाइड जियोलॉजी प्रोग्राम एट द स्कूल ऑफ अर्थ ओशन एंड एटमॉस्फेरिक साइंस गोवा यूनिवर्सिटी पणजी the department of geology at st xavier's college mumbai and the department of geology at the government institute of science aurangabad all the sessions can also be viewed on mission devra youtube channel before we start with today's session let me give you the sequence of the program first we'll have introduction of the speaker by dr ajit vartha then we'll have the lecture by today's speaker ms yogini athreya followed by introduction of the concluding speaker by mr mahesh maikar then we'll have concluding remarks by mr r shankar followed by vote of thanks by dr ajit vartha as we gather for this finale lecture of this remarkable week which we are about to embark using an archaeological adventure what we are going to do is we are going to appreciate earth science education and culminate our celebration with the tribute to earth through the lens of postage stamps so i'll request dr ajit vartak to introduce today's speaker thank you yogini atre she has completed her masters in ancient indian history culture and archaeology from deccan college post graduate and research institute pune she has been associated with the uh, india study center uh, trust for 7 years where she assists is them in organizing their online as well as offline academic program heritage box and lectures while uh, operating their website especially the lms content she has engaged lectures on topics ranging from epigraphy to ancient indian board uh, board games at various levels apart from this she has preserved she has presented many papers at various conferences at national and international level and has to her credit certificates and uh, diplomas in various vistas of archaeology and epigraphy now i request yogini to start her presentation yes sir thank you sir for that wonderful introduction i'm just sharing my screen so on the onset of this lecture first of all i would like to thank dr ajit vartak for inviting me and having that trust on me that i can do a lecture on no, archaeology through philately and uh, before i start i would just like to give two disclaimers uh, the first disclaimer is that um, i am younger than even a newborn baby in the field of philately i was introduced to this field uh, like dr by dr vartak um, in this year's january where he told me that there are some stamps that have inscriptions on them that's what um, made me interested in this field and it was only through interactions with him from the month of march that i have understood how vast this field is um secondly the second disclaimer is actually um a, 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 a cue to actually uh, vaishnavi ma'am um technically when i am uh, excited i tend to speak very fast so in case i speak i start speaking very fast and people are not able to understand what i'm speaking um please put it in the chat box and vaishnavi ma'am just let me know if any, if anybody is having any problem because of my speed okay no problem ma'am definitely yeah so with that let's jump into today's lecture a ticket to archaeology where through poster stamps i try to explain what archaeologists really do so what is archaeology and what archaeologists do so the word archaeology is derived from two greek words archaeos and logia which means ancient study the study of archaeology or the scope of archaeology revolves around understanding the past human activities and before we discuss more on what archaeologists do i would like to make it clear right now that no we don't study dinosaurs we are not like what indiana jones and lara croft portray us 
uh, dinosaur, the field of dinosaurs about which uh, Vikram sir spoke yesterday is de dealt in a separate field called as paleontology. It's a sister field to archaeology, but archaeologists are only vested in what humans did in the past and not dinosaurs and other animals. We interact with them in the per in the purview of how humans interact, ancient humans interacted with the animals, ancient humans interacted with the environment in that sense, but we are technically associated with the study of past human activities. Uh, moving on, moving from that, what archaeologists really do is we recover and we analyze the material culture that has been left behind, like the artifacts, artifacts, bio, uh, bio facts, architectural, anything that comes to us from the past, um, things that the past humans have left for us, that is what we analyze. It, our work is to understand why is a particular thing there or why a particular thing is not there. Archaeology is a science which deals with the question how and why. And then we use a lot of uh, techniques to answer these questions, yeah, come to certain conclusions. But more or less, archaeologists revolve around the analysis of the material culture. Uh, Though we say that you know archaeologists study the human past activity, it is essentially the study of present. Because see, whatever we are studying, like whatever from the past has come to the present, like whatever remains of the past we have in the present today that we get while excavating, while exploring, is what we study. So it's more of like you know, you are supposed to solve a puzzle with only 10% of its pieces. So the work of archaeologists becomes a bit difficult when you have to like you know try to understand how the past function but based on whatever remains have come to us in the present history is just a part of archaeology archaeology is like is a broader umbrella where history is just a branch of it and how do archaeologists go about studying the past human activities we do it through explorations and excavations this stamp that you can see is the stamp of the site, the stamp of the site named Dilmun. And it is one of the very important sites which played a key part in the Mesopotamian and the, the trade that happened between the Mesopotamian and the Indus Valley civilization. So why is archaeology a part of the Earth Science Week celebration, even when archaeology is associated with just humans? If you can see, this is the 24 hour, like if we have to understand the evolution of life forms uh, by a 24 hour clocks, you would have noticed that it is in the last two minutes that humans actually come on the surface of the earth. If this is the plan, this, all this has been discussed in the previous lectures, how dinosaurs were existing and everything. But it is only in the last two minutes that are your other that um, humans actually enter and finally become a part of this earth science. But though they came in the in pretty end in the like in the last two minutes, we have technically, we as in humans have technically interacted with every other aspect that falls in the purview of earth science. We have interacted with minerals, we have interacted with fossils, we have interacted with um, volcanoes, we have interacted with climate change. So that is why humans and we have need, we are still interacting with these things. So humans become indirectly a very important part of the entire earth science scope. And that is why archaeology is a part of this earth science week celebrations. So what do archaeologists really find when they explore or excavate. So explorations and excavates, excavations don't really go hand in hand. Sometimes it just happens that archaeologists explore a particular area and they are satisfied with the explorations or some other reasons. They, they don't go on to excavate that particular area. Or sometimes it happens so that we explore a particular area and then go on to ex excavate it. Excavation is a separate, it's a, it's a separate thing and exploration is a separate thing. So whenever we are exploring, whenever we, as in whenever archaeologists are exploring or excavating, uh, the most common thing that they find are these potsherds. Potsherds are nothing but um, broken pottery pieces. And uh, pots were basically vessels, yeah, how do I say, burthens of ancient times. And they help us to identify a lot of things. So most of the times, the most, the most, uh, the most, uh, the, the most, uh, 
thing that we find in while exploring or excavating is the potsherds followed by the followed by the beads um we also find beads made from you know certain semi precious materials like carnelian jade etc while exploring exploring we also stumble upon various stone tools apart from that we also stumble upon skeleton remains that are human like human skeletal remains and also animal skeleton remains now when we stumble upon animal skeleton remains though our study is based on past human activities we try to understand how humans interacted with these animals we also get structural remains sometimes structures like these huge proper structures or sometimes just remnants of structures like post holes and stuff like that uh we also stumble upon various antiquities like inscriptions coins sculptures and from all of these broken pieces of history we have to stitch one piece with another to make sense of exactly what happened in the past now i don't remember in which lecture but i think in the volcanoes lecture or in the climate change lecture sir was saying that um, geologists always talk in the years of you know million years ago ya yeah, 1000 million years ago something in that sense so um, when we talk about geology geologists usually talk talk in the terms of epochs and eons archaeologists talk in the sense of eras and years so when we i i think most of us here are um, familiar with the geological time scale so every field has its own time scale so how we have geological time scale in the similar way we have something called as the archaeological time scale the way archaeologists um try to understand the past so in archaeological time scale the first period of study is the prehistory period now prehistory is that period where there was there is no evidence of writing writing did not exist but that does not mean ki language did not exist it's just that we don't have written evidences of any sort it is in this phase that the entire evolution of the human species happened right from its ancestral um, ancestors like australopithecus afarensis to today's homo sapiens sapiens this is the time period when this evolution was happening and archaeologists don't study this evolution only in the sense of physical you know ki what kind of physical changes were there but we also try to understand how mentally we evolved from our previous ancestors to how we are today and this phase is broadly sub categorized into paleolithic which is old stone age mesolithic middle stone age and neolithic that is new stone age now one thing uh, which all of us have to understand here is the time period of these phases keep on changing according to the area so the paleolithic time period for india would be different than the paleolithic time period for africa than the paleolithic time period for um, europe america japan southeast asia so it keeps on changing but what you have to remember is the earliest evidence of human fossils that archaeologists have ever found comes from africa this particular stamp that you can see is of olduvai gorge the birth place of um if i would say human the the human species uh, the mention of olduvai gorge has, has happened for quite some times in the previous um, sessions so for those who don't know what olduvai gorge is olduvai gorge is a place in um, tanzania which yields all the um skeletons of ancestral humans the so and it's like the birthplace of where it's called the cradle of human civilization uh so at olduvai gorge we have found various um examples of ancient skeletons one of them being this part of this particular individual this particular individual as you can see on the stamp is uh, the skeleton it belongs to a particular species called as australopithecus afarensis now uh, though today we call ourselves as homo sapiens uh, homo species as such came a bit later on the ancestral species to homo species were australopithecus the species of australopithecus and of that this particular species plays a very important role uh this particular stamp as you can see has been um, released in the year 2020 shows the skull of how an australopithecus afarensis would have looked 
and this is after doing a 3d imagery this is how our ancestors would have looked at that time when they were existing now coming to this particular stamp there's a very interesting story to it can you see there's a skeleton depiction of but it's not like the entire skeletal body is not seen but there are some uh, parts of arms of some parts of legs the pelvis region is seen some part of skulls so this particular skeletal remains is of a person called as lucy uh, how did we name her lucy is because uh, there was this one person called as uh, donald um, donald johansen who was um, exploring the regions of um, like regions of um, ethiopia so what was happening in early 1950s early 1970s the entire african strip was being explored by various paleoanthropologists and uh, geologists and archaeologists to understand how humans evolved uh, while mary leakey and louis leakey were so you already know like from the fossils lecture and even in yesterday's lecture vakil sir mentioned about uh, mary leakey and louis leakey so these guys they were exploring the regions of tanzania and kenya there was another set of duo that is uh, Do donald johansen and kupins who were exploring the regions of ethiopia and one fine day they while they were exploring a region which was already explored and nobody had found anything there they stumbled upon a skull bone and uh, while when like when this when 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 you are exploring and you suddenly stumble upon a skull bone you you try to like you know look around for different um, things in and around there so while they were looking they realized that it is not just a random skull bone but an entire um, intact skeleton that was lying in front of them so what they did is they marked that area and came back the next day to properly systematically excavate it and once they excavated it properly this is what came out of it and that day they were very happy because in ethiopia this was like the first kind of discovery that was happening like an, an almost entire um, skeletal remain of a human they had found moreover they could identify it that it is a skeletal of a female um, female ancestor because of the because they could find half of the bone of the pelvis region uh there are various markers through which archaeologists try to understand uh what who skeleton it could have been whether it could have been a male skeleton or a female skeleton skeletal of an adult or a young young child you know there are various markers to it so they understood that this is a skeletal remain and of an ancient uh, human who is a female and uh, in the evenings like this so this happened around about like uh in the afternoonish time and in the evening what happens is whenever you are on excavations the evening times are pretty chill so everybody in the group sits together and they kind of talk to each other and then there are songs that are getting played in the background and etc that particular evening when they found this uh, sculpture the song that was being played repeatedly in the camp was lucy in the sky of diamonds by beatles and that's how one of the members in the team said this is our lucy from that time this particular sculpture uh, so not sculpture this particular skeleton is named as lucy and we always call her lucy the australopithecus afarensis there were other human ancestors to homo sapiens those were uh, paranthropus bosai this is how he would look a uh, paranthropus bosai today is called as australopithecus bosai and there are a lot of um, no the reason there are a lot of reasons to why the name was changed the first homo ancestor of homo sapiens is homo habilis and we also call him the handyman because it is during his time that we come to know uh, that humans actually started using like started making stone tools so uh, homo habilis is the first species who started making stone tools before him we know that uh, the the uh, ancestors of like australopithecus afarensis would have used stone tools uh, stone tools but it is from homo habilis that we actually get examples of him making the stone tool and also using it and he is usually associated with the old worn uh, stone tools after him in the series comes homo erectus who is now a proper bipedal human as you can see him standing 
erect with on his two feet bipedal as in the one who can walk on two feet he ha he is holding a weapon a pointed weapon made of wood and more or less you can see in what kind of environment he has been living followed by homo uh, erectus we have next coming up uh, the next species of humans that came were homo neanderthals now the earliest skeletal remains of homo neanderthals was found in german and it was around like they existed around 1.3 million years ago and this is how they look it's a fantastic stamp which gives us an idea of how their skeletal remains were how their skull, how their skull look how their appearance would have been in what kind of background that they were living so in this one particular stamp you can understand everything and uh, like we've been discussing a lot about the artists who make this stamp and like i really give a salute to the artists who made all the stamps that i have used in this lectures to properly portray certain ideas which otherwise would have been very difficult to explain uh homo neanderthals were very important because the a lot of firsts happen in the uh, during their time so it's the first time that we come to know uh, that these were the ones who took care of their dead they, uh, the their deads and the elderly so the earlier early burial traditions are something that we start getting from the uh, time of the homo neanderthals and finally homo sapiens come into picture around uh, if i have to put it in a very simple way around 3 lakh years ago and this particular stamp is very interesting because it helps us to compare how the anatomical evolution has happened between the homo neanderthals and the homo sapiens you can see how the skull shape has changed how our uh, spine has changed how the bones of scapulas have changed so it gives us an idea of what kind of other changes climate whether it's climatic whether it's dietary whether it is the way uh, we think or you know other things that would have happened to lead to these kind of um, changes now how do we understand uh, the ancestral past or the evolution series um, or how do we um, interact with our human ancestors is through their stone tools and many other things that they have left behind uh, most of the times what what archaeologists get into the get in the while exploring or while excavating are the stone tools see this is where i'm starting this is where the point of study of present comes um human ancestors would have worked around a lot of things like they would have used wood around them they would have definitely used leather they would have used animal skin they would have used ivory they would have used other perishable things also but in an archaeological context it is the uh, context it is the stone tools that we usually get so it is majority of the times through the stone tools that we try to understand how they would have evolved or how they would have reacted to the environment in which they are existing now when i was talking about the homo habilis making something called as old one stone tools um this is how an old one axe looks like it's very um hand it's it's very uh, heavy it's a heavy duty tool usually used for scavenging purposes now this particular stamp is like one stop shop to explain the tool set or the tool kit of what a prehistoric human would have he would have a um, a, a hand axe something like this so this belongs to the next phase of phase an evolution phase from old one this belongs to a, something called as acheulean hand axe tradition this is the blade stone all these are made from stones right so this is a hand axe this is a blade this is points or you can also call it call, call it as a scraper and this is a burin so all these would have been like a proper tool kit like how we have tool kits like we have screw drivers we have hammers uh, we have uh, something to you know a, a hole into uh, different things so similarly a prehistoric man would also have different tools for different activities and he would he would keep resharpening it again and again and that we understand through these micro touches that the, uh, that we can see on the stone tools 
And now this particular stamp again is very interesting because it is a kind of recreation, uh, a reconstruction of how they would make a particular stone tool. Can you see the way this person is sitting, the way he has held, this is, he's sharpening one of the tools. And you can immediately understand how a blade would be, so this is a way a blade would be sharpened. So stamps like these help us to understand and help us to like um, relate to our past, relate to how the past humans interacted with their uh, environment in a very simple and in a very instant way. Now, this particular stamp is also very interesting. As you can see, this is an adz stone tool, which is hafted on a bone, I would say, on a bone, uh, uh, bone holder or a wood holder. Now, what happens in most of the archaeological context is this bone or this wood usually gets perished. It does not survive. And what we have is we only have this particular stone to understand how this particular tool was used. But through stamps like these, we can understand that how uh, this was hafted on the tool and how they would carry it from one place to another, et cetera, et cetera. And this is a very cool stamp of Neanderthal man walking in his uh, territory with one with fire in one hand and a wooden tool in another hand. Apart from the stone tools, we also get evidences of art in their period, in the prehistoric period. So whether they are in the form of petroglyphs or whether in, they are in the form of uh, rock cut paintings, or whether in, they are in the form of these uh, Venus figurines. We really understand what, from, from these as, uh, things, we try to understand what they thought, why did they think, why a particular thing has been uh, uh, put up here, or why a particular thing is missing from here. So all those kind of questions can be answered when we um, try to analyze things archaeologically. Interestingly, such petroglyphs have now been found in our own Maharashtra, in uh, Ratnagiri region and in the regions of Ratnagiri and Sindhudur. But apparently, we don't have any stamp on it. But these uh, and the nature of uh, petroglyphs in Ratnagiri and Sindhudur are amazing. They have a variety of things depicted on stone. And apart from that, they are not just small uh, in size, but they're actually geoglyphs. So we really need to have a stamp on that because geoglyphs is something, especially in the prehistoric period, having geoglyphs is a very great thing. Uh, with time, what happened is the environment kept changing. So when we say, you know, uh, the, the prehistoric man used stone tools, the prehistoric man used scraper, the overall um, climate was different during that time. And uh, as I was saying that what uh, the geologists speak in the terms of eons and epochs, there is there was this one uh, transition that was happening from a Pleistocene epoch to Holocene epoch where the global temperature scenarios were changing. So we have something called as the glacial interglacial phases where the glaciers were residing uh, or something in the sense that the like imagine a forest area turning into grasslands. So the entire flora fauna was changing globally and to adapt to such changes, uh, the prehistoric man had to, you know, bring out new tools in his, uh, in his uh, kit. So what the prehistoric man at that time did that uh, when once the shift happened from forest to grasslands, there was a lot of uh, flight birds or, you know, flight weapons that was introduced. So all the heavy duty weapons had to be now discarded. The heavy, by heavy duty, I mean those heavy duty hand axes or heavy duty scape, scrapers were now not in use, uh, like were now outdated compared to the cli climate in which they were living. So they had a lot of uh, hand ballistic weapons like these harpoons or, you know, at it, at it, like which they could throw from, from one place to another and it would, you know, kind of, it would be ballistic in nature. So they would be able to throw it. Now, hand axes, hand axes were such that you could not propel it. So uh, they started coming up with lighter tools that they could propel like these har like this particular harpoon or such microlithic tools were made. Now, by microliths, I mean stone tools that were made in smaller in size 
which could be used for attacking purposes rather than defense. And we also get evidences of such fish traps uh, from the Mesolithic age. The Neolithic age, which is a part of, again, the prehistory uh, tradition, um, is the age from where we start getting the evidences of agriculture. That's the first time pottery is invented because now you need something to store, right? Because agriculture is all about surplus. Today you cultivate, but the produce that you cultivate today, you don't consume it in like a day or two. You keep it over the months. So how will you keep it? Um, so where will you keep it? All that problems was addressed by ancient humans. And we start... Uh, we start seeing the coming up of pottery. So first it was just handmade pottery like this. Then we saw wheel made potteries coming up. And like that man tried to um, ease his life even then. And we also start understanding how philosophies, how religion, how abstract ideas were depicted through different things. So this is an amulet coming from the Neolithic age from China. And this in this particular stamp, you can see a man trying to, you know, understand whether this area is okay to um, sow seeds or not. So through stamps, there are all these concepts, like to explain these concepts, it becomes very easy. Now the next phase, that is the proto-historic phase, like in the chronological phase of archaeologists, the second phase that archaeologists study is the proto-historical phase. Now, interestingly, proto-history is something that only exists in the Indian subcontinent. That is because it is only in the areas of Indus Valley civilization that we have a script. We have evidences of writing, but writing is not deciphered. Yet. In other areas, like uh, Mesopot like the other areas which existed with Indus Valley civilization, like the Mesopotamian civilization, the Egyptian civilization, there the existence of script is also there. Plus, now we can understand why this what particular thing is written like what the seals say or what the writings say so proto is so they now that becomes a part of their history but we like the indus valley part or the harappan civilization part remains a uh, proto historical because we have not been able to crack the script that day indus valley script gets deciphered that day the phase of proto history will become history in the in india's uh, uh, era, for India, because from that time we we'll start associating Indus Valley in the phase of history. So what happens in the Harappan civilization or what is a transition that is happening is from stone tools, we see the tools are now gradually shifting into metal. So we have use of metals, which we call them as Chalcolithic age. And uh, the entire, so now the entire uh, Harappan civilization has been divided into three phases. So first is the early phase, the second is the mature phase, and the third is the late phase. Now, um, this particular stamp is very interesting because it talks about something called as save Mohenjo-daro, you know, save Mohenjo-daro. So what was happening is that in Pakistan, they had created a dam near Sukut in uh, 1932s, uh, nine, around about, yeah, in 1930s. There, what was happening is they uh, the like the construction of dam led to increase of water in the Indus River, which was threatening the site of Mohenjo-daro. So various countries like um, Oman and Mauritius, like various countries, released stamp in order to uh, you know support the movement of Pakistani archaeologists of you know saving the sites of Mohenjo-daro, saving the sites of Harappa. So this is why the stamps were released. And finally, the dam, the, the this particular site got protection and the entire flow was diverted. Otherwise, this site would have now been corroded un under the salt that Indus River would bring with it. Now, these are the various ring wells which existed in the time of um, the like, in the time of Harappan civilization at Mohenjo-daro, and that is how they managed to get their water supplies. Uh, it is very interesting because this stamp was released on the 50th anniversary of the excavations at Mohenjo-daro. This is a very interesting stamp as it portrays a seal on it found at Kalibangan. And uh, as you can see here, the animal is drinking water from the turf. 
this particular stamp has already been discussed by nicole ma'am when she was talking about oceanography and how ancient uh, people would uh, travel using or trade using oceans and this is the terracotta seal uh, seal which tells us about that part uh, that particular boat which existed during the times of mature during the mature phase of the harappan civilization from this stamp we come to know what kind of uh, costumes these people were um, wearing and how they would interact with each other and uh, this particular photo is quite interesting because um, in as a part of our harappan celebrations uh, there was a celebrations with instru instruction trust did termed as 100 at harappa because 100 years had passed since the discovery of harappa in 2021 we released a series of of um, magnets in the shape of postal stamps and this particular lady that you can see is the famous dancing girl statue the next period of from uh, the chalcolithic age we move on to megalithic period which is the megalithic which actually translates into the big boulders so it's the period of big boulders here again we have writing we have graffiti marks in the way of uh, on on potsherds but again we are not able to understand what those really what those marks really tell us so again this more or less comes under the uh, the umbrella of proto history but it's a separate period called as the megalithic period and it is usually associated with burial traditions and uh, south india is like yielding a lot of evidences of such traditions south india as in uh, good uh, na uh, karnataka tamil nadu all uh, andhra pradesh kerala even the southern part of maharashtra is yielding a lot of uh, such megalithic burial traditions uh one of the very famous tradition of uh, megaliths is um uh, erection of such menhirs so such menhirs are just are huge standing stones that are erected after a death of a person so in the memory to remember like this a particular person such huge say single uh, boulders are erected at different parts we also have something called as dolmens um these are uh, these are actually burial chambers where maybe at one point um skeleton remains were kept and this particular hole is very interesting because even today there are certain communities which believe that they can interact with the dead people um in their afterlife and by putting offering certain things to eat offering certain things like certain important things like jewelry um they are kind of keeping their ancestors happy there is another interesting uh, megalithic cultural uh, tradition of topi kallu now to topi is basically this cap and kallu is stone so it's like a tradition of cap stones which is very famous in south india especially if next time you ever visit the meghuti temple at aihore behind the temple if you would just see you will find certain evidences of such stones behind so just behind the temple next time when you are going uh, once you visit the temple just try to look out behind the temple over the hills and you will find things like that apart from that we also have evidences of stone circles coming from south india but this stamp is of uh, is of gambia but we have such megalithic burials even in india the next phase which is very popular and all of us know is the historical phase where now we have writing and now we also understand what's um, written so all the writing of the historical phase is more or less deciphered we know what like we can read the brahmi script we can read the kharoshti script we understand the prakrit language you know in that sense and this is the time when our dynasty start emerging like we have the mauryan period dynasty we have kushanas we have satvanas we have guptas we have the badami chalukyas we have pratiharas palas like everything that starts from the mauryan period till the coming up of britishers everything is a part of history even the as you know british history comes under the uh, the uh, umbrella of contemporary history so the moment writing is deciphered and we understand what is written that phase is called as history and we have lot of uh, ways of so this is this stamp is of the didarganj yakshi um, who was found during the uh, she is dated to the mauryan period and that's because of the mauryan polish that she has and this is the stamp of vasudeva one nicely flexing 
his arms holding a spear and uh, the deity behind this this is the uh, obverse side of the coin and this is the reverse side of the coin now for and so now these are the phases right that i discussed so we had some we have something called as prehistory that is mainly based on stone tools and that talks about the evolution of humans then we have something called as proto historic phase which is actually the indus valley civilization phase and finally the historical phase where all the dynasties start coming in and etc so how do we understand while exploring that uh, how like, a particular artifacts while exploring or excavating that like for example we while exploring we find a pottery piece so how do we understand whether that pottery uh, thing belongs to which period whether it is to the early agricultural phase or whether it is to the indus valley phase or whether it is a mauryan pottery so how do we understand that we understand that using various dating techniques now again caution these dating techniques are not the dating techniques employed by youngsters in the month of february it is very different and we rely on something called as absolute dating and relative dating technique where stratigraphy plays a very important role now um, in the previous lectures on earth sciences that you would have attended many scholars have already discussed about nicolas nicolas steno and his rules about stratigraphy and i think most of us in the audience understand what stratigraphy is but for those people who don't understand what stratigraphy is or find it difficult to understand just remember stratigraphy as a piece of cake as a piece of pastry as you can see here now when you make pastry or when you eat pastry you know that it is it has lot of layers and while making pastry obviously this will be the first layer that the chef would have put on that would have come a layer of cream again a cake layer again a cream layer and again a cake layer finally a covering it with cream this is exactly the role stratigraphy plays in. can you see here now compare these layers uh, the pastry layers with this set of gravels and you will understand that how layer upon layer the history gets built and like literally gets compacted over the period of time and my understanding a particular especially while excavating while understand uh, when we get a particular uh, piece like for example as you can see that this particular gravel belongs to the roman period the roman road this is the roman road gravel so if i found a find a pottery piece or say for example find a coin piece from here i know that it belongs to the roman period that's how important stratigraphy is in the field of archaeology and in the field of geology this particular stamp is very interesting because it shows the geological strata at chile um this stamp is very interesting so everybody asks me you know are tum log to excavate karte ho so excavating is like digging so what is the difference between you guys digging and what is the difference between the bmc people digging so i always have to start by telling them that there's a lot of difference between the archaeological digs that happened and the bmc tmc digs that happened uh, our digs are not random and only when it is 110% necessary that is only when we you know when we think of excavations otherwise most of the times we are always uh, thinking of exploring an area and being content with explorations but only when we realize that no explorations are not enough we need to excavate that's when we start excavating excavating is nothing but the systematic dis, um, like deconstruction of the site it is a, it is actually destruction and but the only uh, thing that we do is we do it very systematically our entire area is divided into certain grids so we take the uh, the uh, axis according to the cardinal sides we divide the area under uh, such grids using iron pegs and like there's a lot of uh, methodology that goes in dividing the area and section by section grid by grid we start excavating uh it's a very tedious process it has to be done very systematically and very methodologically and uh, no not anybody who can you know who thinks who will get like it's 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 a very um how do i put it very systematic thing it's a thing of lot of responsibilities and it is something that you have to learn by experience so yeah this is more or less how the excavation happens this is more or less how the archaeologists also look at site uh, we are our faces covered our hands are covered 
we are all covered with dust and this particular uh, postcard is of pompeii i remember in the volcanoes lecture sir mentioning about the mount vesuvius volcano was uh, eruption and how the entire site of pompeii was covered by lava and people did not get time to um, run or save themselves from that lava and the entire city got submerged in the flowing lava and uh, which is actually true because in archaeological excavations we get such bodies so this is particularly a cast of a body found from the garden at the city of pompeii this postcard was released by italy and it's not just one but there are many such things which tell us that yeah people did not happen and pompeii is like a like in our archaeological terms we call it a blessing site because we can construct 95% of history based on what was there because thanks to mount vesuvius everything at one point just got statued over there and from that we can really understand how people how the life of people would have been now while talking about dating the uh, of all the dating techniques what i would like to talk about is the tree growth ring dating technique which is uh, the dendro which is the dend uh, dendrochronology technique and why i want to talk about this technique is because we have stamps related to this particular technique so what happens is the width of the ring of the the growth ring around the tree uh, grows every year and it is based on a lot of internal and external factors and especially rainfall now based on that particular growth ring archaeologists come to understand that how a particular climate would have changed every year and in that sense how humans would have changed um, or what things would have changed in the human uh, context to uh, combat with those particular climate changes now the bristle cone pine tree was the tree that was used for uh, understanding the this particular dendrochronological technique because this particular tree has been surviving for more than 4000 years now irony is such that the tree which has been surviving which had been surviving for more than 4000 years has now become an endangered species because we have we as in for this technique and for various other reasons we have been cutting down the tree because only if we cut the tree at its axis can we understand how many growth rings and how the growth rings have changed so in that sense because of the sheer cutting down of these trees over the years this tree has now become an endangered species so now for dendrochronology we are trying to use different trees which is the oak tree and uh, there is a limit to how much amount of trees are being cut in the for the use of uh, dendrochronological techniques and uh, now that the data is available worldwide and correspondence between archaeologists or oh, archaeologists over the globe is happening frequently the tree cutting for at least for this reason has stopped apart from that we use a lot of relative dating technique of which pottery is uh, very important now one thing that you have to understand about pottery is once it is fired once you bake the pottery or once it is fired it becomes imperishable it is very difficult for pottery to perish and truly potsherds are ancient plastic everywhere you just stumble upon such potsherds every excavations we have so many potsherds that we get uh, that we keep getting and pottery was something that people used day to day it was their vessels you know so you obviously you interact how many times like in a day you will interact with your vessels in the same way the humans of the past interacted with these vessels and every um, pottery has a story to tell every pottery has a particular culture that it belong to see as simple as today in our houses majority of our houses uh, we use stainless steel vessels right at one point we were using steel vessels now we use stainless steel vessels this is the story of every other middle class indian household but think of the vessels in the household of say ambanis or tatas or people who are you know rich or who belong to the ultra rich class the vessels that they would use in their day to day lives which be would be definitely different than what we use in our day to day lives similarly 
I am sure that every household has a particular set of vessels that we one uses for day to day purposes. Then there are particular set of vessels which are only used when certain guests come. Then there are certain vessels which are only used when you know special guests come. So from a particular usage of a pottery piece or of a pottery vessel, we can understand whether it was a day to day pottery ware, whether it was a premium pottery ware. Or whether it was an ultra premium pottery ware, and what kind of vessels were being used? Like you can see, this particular pot has is is leg. It has legs, so it can stand by itself. This particular pottery is coming with a lid, so something would and it's highly decorated. So the chances of using it for day to day use is quite less because you can see there are sculptures on it, there is engravings on it, there is a lot of designing on it. This is again a carinated ware. Which describes it. It's a red, like black on red ware, but it's highly decorated, and the decorations are quite symmetrical. So from this, we can understand that this is a wheel-made pottery rather than a hand-made pottery, and different stuffs like that. This particular pottery, pot shard or pottery, is very important because it belongs to a tradition called as amphora. Now, amphoras were specifically Roman wares that Romans. Roman Empire used to use for trading and their day-to-day -day purposes. But when we get Roman amphorae wares in the Indian context, it talks about like it gives us evidence about the Indo-Roman trade that was happening in the ancient period. So these particular wares, this part, this particular shape of this ware only tells us that this was a Rome. It was an amphora because what is the speciality of amphora is having these. Curved base. Can you see this curved base, which corresponds to the side of a ship? Now imagine if I'm tying this. There's a rope here, and I'm tying it to one of the corners of the ship. So these wares were shipped with a lot of liquids filled in them, and most of the times it would be Roman wine. And uh, there was a part, like in Nicole Mann's lecture when she was talking about marine archaeology. Uh, when we try to understand such submerged ships and try to understand, you know, those ships that drown, a lot of those, a lot of in such lot of ship, ships, uh, we do find such kind of wares, especially having evidences of Roman wine and Roman oil in them. Now, apart from pot shirts, we also get coins, and now coins help us to understand what kind of economy was. uh functioning at that particular point of time so we have uh coins of the of the lichavis on the stamp we have the coins of the, this particular coin is very important because it shows the trajan or the trojan bridge which was a very important uh, part of the roman empire uh, ruling over the danube area and we also come to know that the ancient ancient coins were not always circular but they were also like looking like the, like like this so this is a part, a particular example of spade currency that comes from ancient china and uh, from coins we understand how the society has moved from the barter system to now we are actually understanding that okay this particular piece helps us to understand like this particular piece is used as exchange and money which also helps us to understand that how exchanges were happening cross culture across the borders etc etc we also stumble upon various inscriptions uh, while we are exploring or while we are excavating now inscriptions belong to various scripts now scri uh, why i am emphasizing on this point is because at one point we forget what a script is and what language is so scripts are essentially what we write and language is essentially what we speak so right now i'm speaking in english language but if the same thing i had to write it down i would write it in the roman script and inscriptions have been like an important key to unlock lot of histories or unlock past in certain ways uh, because they help us to understand what was happening in the society uh, this particular stamp was released by egypt in 2022 which marks the bicentenary of the deciphering of the rosetta stone inscription now rosetta stone inscription is very important in the history of egypt because it is through this particular stone that the entire egyptian hieroglyphs were deciphered this rosetta stone 
is um, holds inscriptions in three scripts and two languages. The three scripts were Egyptian hieroglyphic script, Egyptian di uh, the uh, the Egyptian dimotic script, and the uh, the Greek script. And the language was Greek language and the Egyptian language, because people of that time, the the French explorers of that time, could understand Greek language and Greek script in a jiffy. They knew what the stone was telling. So they had to just you know walk, understand how the same thing in the Greek language and Greek script was explained in the Egyptian language and Egyptian scripts. And this curiosity led to the decipherment of Egyptian hieroglyphs. So such pieces of inscription become very important to understand how the past societies function. Apart from that, we also get sculptures. And icons, like as you can see, this is a particular terracotta icon, a particular terracotta sculpture. Uh, but it is not just any random sculpture, but it has also also has a pot on its its head. So it was used. It has a it has a by purpose for uh, its use. Then we have the entire terra sculptures of the terracotta army coming from China, or we have the or sculptures from coming from the Mauryan period. So every sculpture, every icon gives. Uh, a, a hint to the period that it belongs to, gives a hint to the past cultures that it belongs to, and it comes under the purview of iconography and iconology. But archaeologists have to be, uh, you know, ex not expert, but they need to know what a particular sculpture is telling, what a particular sculpture is trying to tell. Not only sculptures in so stone, but we also have such sculptures. So this is a particular tunic. Of uh, the Kush of Kushana period, it's a stamp uh, released by Afghanistan de uh, depicting the tunic of a scu sculptures from the Kushana period. Or we have uh, the sculptures like of you know this is the Bharut sculptures uh, kept in the Mathura Museum, and this stamp is also released like uh, by India. Or we have such sculptures of Goddess Saraswati, uh, which we try to understand and make sense of ki, what these particular sculptures are trying to say. Not only sculptures in stone, but also the sculptures are the icons in paintings. So this stamp depicts a painting from Ajanta Caves. Uh, uh, so we try to understand. So we have a range of subjects that we try to understand. Uh, so sculptures also uh, become a part of archaeology, and the the icons painted also becomes an, a part of ar um, archaeology. This particular poster stamp is of. The three-headed Shiva at Elephanta. Uh, this is something which Vakil sir was saying yesterday that how with time our knowledge and nomenclature increases because we know a particular subject better. So when we have, when archaeologists and other art historians and sculptor iconologists iconographists had come uh, face to face with this particular sculptures, they called it the three murti and they thought it to be the uh, the depiction of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. But now, over the period of time, we know that it is not Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, but actually the five forms of Shiva itself being depicted. So, though today we don't use the term Trimurti for it, we call it the Sada Shiva at Elephanta. We don't really have any stamp to correct this mistake of ours. Similarly, on stamp, which like we need a stamp for that. Uh, we also have the uh, emergence of Chora bronzes, evidences of Chora bronzes to, through stamps. Archaeologists also involve in the heritage studies. They are associated with studying the tangible and the intangible aspects of heritage. So tangible is something that we can touch and intangible is something that we cannot touch. Uh, so right from studying monuments at Sanchi, monuments at Elora, understanding monuments of Shore Temple at Mahabalipuram, or trying to understand how the, uh, the temples at Hampi, the Rathas at Hampi were made, or you know, making sense of the Islamic calligraphy that is found in Kutub, uh, Kutub Minar or Taj Mahal, or trying to understand the intangible aspect associated with certain particular making traditions, like making of papyrus, uh, certain tailoring traditions, or how ancient potteries were made. Archaeology and archaeologists use a lot of ethno-archaeological techniques, and they are involved into the heritage management, heritage tourism um, areas also. So every time that you hear a site getting a UNESCO tag, in that team, you will always have an archaeologist trying to help the, uh, the other um, heritage experts 
and uh, they, they try to you know understand try to bring out the historicity of that particular site whether it's a, a, a tangible site like you know hampi or say for example elora or whether it is the intangible things that we have like how a particular pottery was made archaeology the range of archaeology is way too much from stamps we can also understand various archaeologists or various uh, experts that contributed to the field of archaeology these two are the famous couple louis leakey and mary leakey about whom we had discussed in detail previously while i was talking about how they explored the regions of tanzania and other regions he is raymond dart who came up with the name australopithecus for us to understand that our ancient ancestors were not just homos but they were also australopithecines uh dd kosambi also contributed to a great extent to the field of archaeology by giving his theory to uh, giving his theory of urban decay the which is now redundant but at one point it was very uh, famous then we have sir william jones who's the founder of the asiatic society to anand kumar swami who's a great art historian to kp jaiswal whose history of india is still referred by various historians amateur historians and archaeologists so just to summarize this entire session i would say that the scope of archaeology is truly unlimited and the work of archaeologists is not just digging but it revolves around many things like we have to identify we have to document we interpret we analyze we comprehend and finally publish uh, different things related to the ancient human past which spans from the prehistoric times right from the humans evolved started to evolve till yesterday but the question always remains or the question that i am always asked is why archaeology uh the answer to this question is not really that simple but for me if i have to answer or you know maybe um, tell that why archaeology is important even in today's time is because a lot of people today think that the field of history and the field of archaeology is a dead field but what you have to remember is even if you go to a doctor and say that you know i have a stomach ache or you know i have fever the first thing that the doctor will ask you is what did you eat yesterday or uh, what did you do yesterday so that also becomes a part of history so history cannot be a dead field as we consider it like as majority of the people consider it archaeology to that extent so history is just a part of archaeology and archaeology helps us to understand who we are what we are actually uh, and it also helps us to learn from the mistakes of the past like for example uh, before covid i remember there was this uh, keto diet which was very uh, famous and a lot of youngsters jumped to it um, to you know it, it was a fastest way to reduce weight and you know get into shape etc etc and one of the things which the keto diet does is that it replaces the carbohydrates that we consume with fats now if a person like, like in general if people would have realized from the time our agriculture began humans especially indians are used to having carbohydrate as a very important part of the of their diets our bodies have evolved in that sense that we need we, we have to consume some amount of carbohydrates every day by replacing that essential amount in by fat is only going to give you health issues and not like help you to reduce weight so that is something that comes from the study of archaeology you know like when we study the neolithic period we we understand that the bodies are now getting accustomed to eat consuming lot of uh, fats uh, sorry consuming lot of carbohydrates consuming lot of milk and within one day just by replacing carbohydrates by fat is some you won't lose weight similarly there are lot of uh, things that happen like for example a uh, population explosion is something which even the civilizations of the past like indus valley civilization or the mesopotamian civilization had to um uh, cater to so how did they come up with solutions is there some way that we can learn from what they did or learn or maybe do something like they did something which resulted in a negative way so we must not be doing that in the same way 
or how did they collaborate with the nature back then how are we corresponding to the natural changes today how did they interact interact with the earth then how are we interacting you know these kind of studies always like these kind of answers always comes from the field of archaeology which will help us to understand how we are moving as a civilization it is yes it is a it is a difficult field but it is also an exciting field because you don't know what we you will stumble upon in the next minute the main problem which the field of fields like archaeology or even for that matter field like earth science is facing is that these fields are becoming less and less relatable to the curious minds now there are various reasons for that happening one is the amount of jargons that academicians use while giving their talks or giving their lectures it is also because the content that we publish is not really um, getting access to the public uh, to the public like tomorrow if uh, i come up with a new inscription at karle caves and publish that uh, how many people visiting karle caves have access to it so there are a lot of issues with that but the main issue is of the the way we uh introduce this field to curious minds see today if i give you a very loaded statement like you know in early 1970s uh, there was this person called as uh, donald johansen who came up who uh, identified sculptures of australopithecus afarensis who is a human ancestor and who survived around 3.5 million years ago first question you'd be like wait wait who who what when where in in what in like in 1970s who Uh, what what is australopithecus afarensis uh, what, what what are you trying to understand you know this this kind of loaded statement kills the curiosity of the people but if i just show them a stamp depicting the skeleton of australopithecus afarensis and just show them you know this is how we looked at one particular time any curious mind would be like acha aisa kya tell me the story behind it so the the unrelatable aspects of archaeology can be made relatable through the field of philately and the stamps that we have are also a part of history a piece of history the stamps that have been released in say early 90s um, early 1920s are now become antiquity in themselves they are now a part of history and now a piece of history in themselves and they are now talking about history so it it actually adds up the value not only to the field of archaeology but to the field of philately also and as you would have seen in the last one hour there is every aspect of archaeology can be unlocked through a philately product whether it is so my lecture was mainly based on postal stamps but there are postcards first day cover special cancellations every aspect of archaeology can be understood the curiosity of the field of archaeology can be in increased with the help of a philatelic product and it is only one ticket is what what you need to understand what archaeology truly is and with that thank you so much and happy earth science week to everybody very nice lecture ma we'll wait for people to ask doubts any questions people you can please put it in the chat box thank you this is a comment from sudha ma'am ma yeah so uh, thank you sudha ma'am and yes the tradition of uh, to topi kallu is very famous in south india and yeah it's called koda kallu in uh, kerala we need more stamps on that so no questions it seems but did say you have any questions no 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 <laughs> so can we proceed further yes yes please Thank you so much, Yogini Ma'am. It was really very interesting lecture, and thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. I thoroughly enjoyed your lecture. Thank you. Now I'll request Mr. Mahesh Maikar to introduce our concluding speaker for the day. Over to you, Mahesh Sir. Thank you, Vishnavi Ma'am. Uh, should we start? Sir has joined. Yes, yes. Sir has joined. So it gives me immense pleasure to introduce. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. So it gives me immense pleasure to introduce the speaker for his concluding remarks, uh, Dr. R. Shankar. He did his master's and PhD from IIT Bombay. He retired from Mangalore University as a professor in marine geology in 2017. He is a recipient of National Mineral Award from Government of India. 
so cv raman award from government of karnataka and young scientist award from the karnataka association for the advancement of science dr shankar has innate interest in earth science education at the school level and its popularization he has carried out activities locally nationally and internationally he is presently advisor for the international geoscience education organization he is the coordinator for international earth science olympiad he is the member for syllabus commission international earth science olympiad also a member for international union of geological science commissioner of geoscience he is a he is he was earlier member and newsletter editor for international union of geoscience uh, geological sciences he was the uh, uh, chair for international geoscience educational organization and he was a chair for examination board and advisory board uh, in the international earth science olympiad after his retirement he is focusing his attention on uh, on earth science education in schools and popularization Uh, of the same in india so may i i kindly request uh, dr shankar to take over thank you uh thank you so much mr mahesh for your kind words of introduction friends a very good evening first of all i must uh, compliment all of you for you know listening to this very nice talk by uh, dr yogini atreya in spite of the much uh, watched india pakistan cricket match which is happening but i don't think we have to chase a very mammoth score so you better off you know here listening to this nice talk so first of all i should say that i'm very pleased to be associated with this uh, concluding session of earth week because uh, wherever there is earth science education particularly for schools and popularization of our subject uh i'm very happy because that is very close to my heart i wish to thank the organizers of earth week in particular dr ajit vartak my very good friend is in me to join you all on this, uh, in this concluding session and to say a few words about uh, the topic of this year's earth week dr yogin is said you know she is very fast in speaking but i am here to compensate her i speak rather slow anyway earth week is a a very nice uh, way to celebrate earth science and to take it forward to schools and colleges and to common people and in india although it is held in different parts of the country pune is one place is where it is held every year without fail as far as i know that uh, you know pune has been in the forefront of taking earth science to all of the people that need it when we talk of uh, earth science education and popularization people use different approaches they use different materials uh, some use field work some use museums some use lectures some you know take up workshops and some use geoparks but unfortunately we have none in our, our own country although we have such wonderful geological structures and features it's a shame big shame that you know we do not have a single geopark in india anyway uh, but also people use uh, stamps or philately to bring out earth signs contained in those stamps like um, all of you who have done excellently well during this earth week <clears throat> i must compliment the organizers particularly dr vartak for this brilliant idea to choose philately to propel earth science education and popularization and this is particularly so at a time when letter writing is almost forgotten probably we don't even use a pen or pencil you know people take photographs with their cell phones and then um, they avoid writing so it's uh, commendable that uh, this is being done when we have lost touch with writing <clears throat> or maybe is this a way to revive the art lovely art of writing writing letters and posting so let's see whatever that is this is a nice exercise 
And I must say that, you know, about a couple of months ago, I had been to Mysore on an invitation from the Mysore Science Foundation to give a talk there. Right in the morning, there was a program wherein they had displayed postcards, about uh, 200 postcards, selected postcards were displayed. And uh, this was organized by the Mysore F Science Foundation in collaboration with the Department of Posts. You know, what they did, they asked school children to make drawings, color or uh, simply sketches of uh, moths and butterflies. And they got, you know, I think probably a thousand postcards and they chose about 200 of them, very nice ones. And that is one way to promote using postcards. So probably we should do this, a similar activity in India so that, you know, letter writing is uh, revived. <clears throat> now coming to the topic of philatelic in earth science, I never knew that, you know, so many things existed until Dr. Vartak introduced me to this uh, exciting field of philately. You know, Dr. Yog Yogini said, you know, she was introduced to this field. So like you, I was also introduced to this field by Dr. Vartak uh, um, some years hello, ago. Hello, sir. Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, Yogini here. Um, I'm not a doctor, sir, yet. I have not started my PhD. So Soon you'll become one. Don't <laughs> <Thank> worry. <you. laughs> okay, I'll call you on. Miss Yogini, is it all right? Okay. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Remember that one day you'll be a doctor. Thank you, sir. <laughs> now, there are some very nice examples of how, you know, stamps have been used very effectively. If I would like to, if I can share screen, I'll show just two examples. There was a stamp in uh, the Brazilian coffee market. They were displaced from number one position and Colombia occupied the top spot. So they didn't know what to do. And one of the approaches uh, they took was to release a stamp like this one, wherein there is a, a coffee beans and a cup of coffee. And not only this, you know, they put a resin, coffee resin in the paste behind the stamp. So when you paste the stamp on the cover, you, know, you get the coffee aroma. And that was so effective that, you know, Brazil came back to number one position displacing Colombia. <clears throat> Isn't that brilliant? So it needs unity of people. Use stamps to our advantage. In fact, uh, anything we want to use to our advantage. And the second one is about, uh, you know, the first zone. And one way was to use stamps to bring about awareness about what meant, you know, this is, for example, prevent forest fires and careless moment to have fires and all that. So, all possible, if we make use of uh, stamps or anything for that matter to our advantage. And Dr. Vartak has been, uh, you know, spurring people, requesting people to do this, release stamps on important occasions. And I think uh, during the IGC, which did not happen in Delhi, <clears throat> subsequently some stamps were released to commemorate the uh, 36th IGC, which uh, got uh, canceled later. So there is a need for us to do similar stamps, uh, stamps in India on earth science topics. Not many are there. But look at in other countries, they've done so well, so many stamps on so many varied aspects of earth sciences. So I would like to say a big thank you and request all of you to give a big hand to Dr. Ajit Vartak for all his wonderful contributions to popularization of earth science and uh, promoting earth science education. And if uh, all retired scientists, all retired uh, professors, all retired geologists could contribute something, uh, a few activities in a year. <clears throat> I'm sure that, you know, earth science will be on a much higher pedestal in our country and it will uh, <clears throat> get much better recognition, much better visibility in our society. 
because it richly deserves all this. So with these few words, I would like to thank the organizers once again, and I wish to thank all of you for your patient hearing. Thank you. And have a nice weekend. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. I'll now request Dr. Ajit Varkar to say a few words. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Vaishnav. Uh, on behalf of Maharashtra Vukshu Samvardhini Pune, School of Earth, Ocean and Atmospheric Sciences, Goa University, Department of Geology, St. Xavier's College, Mumbai, and PG Department of Geology, Government Institute of Science, Aurangabad, a big thank you to all who helped during this Earth Science Week 2023 event. I want to express my deepest gratitude to our guest of honor, Professor M.G. Thakkar, Director, Birbal Sani Institute of Paleo Sciences, Lucknow, and Professor M.P. Singh, President, Paleontological Society of India, for presiding over the inaugural session of this lecture series. Also, a very special thank to uh, Professor R. Shankar for giving his uh, concluding remarks. All of our guest speakers, it was a pleasure. Dr. Nikhil Sikvir, Dr. Sudha Vadadi, Dr. Ramesh Kumar, Dr. Abhay Mudolkar, Vikram Vakil and Yogini Atreya deserve special appreciation for their willingness to participate and share their knowledge with us. On a special note, I would like to express my sincere thanks to Kaustub Mudgal, Emblem Pune, Dr. Sanjeev Kalaswar, USA, Professor R. Shankar, Mangaluru, Vaishnavi Salvi, and Dr. Ashwin Pundlik, Department of Geology, St. Xavier's College, Mumbai, and Mr. Sharad Patak and Manik Patak from Maharashtra Vuksha Samvardhini Pune and all the members from Maharashtra Vuksha Samvardhini team, School of Earth, Ocean and Atmospheric Sciences, Goa University, Department of Geology, St. Xavier's College, Mumbai and PG Department of Geology, Government of Institute of Science, Aurangabad for their support and assistance in organizing this event. No program can be successful without an audience. In that regard, we have been extremely fortunate with the overwhelming response received. So thank you for participation. Before I conclude, I would like to suggest everyone to acquire some hobby like philately because hobbies keep you motivated and inspired to try something different, new, and this gives you relaxation. Once again, a big thanks to one and all. Until our next event, I wish you all the very best. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everybody. So we can conclude the lecture for today. Thank you. We we'll announce that this uh, week is over. Yes. Well, so we can formally announce that this year's Earth Science Week 2023 is officially over. But everyone, please do subscribe to Mission Devra YouTube channel and stay connected. Thank you. Anyone want to have more information about philately or anything, you can directly contact to us. Our YouTube channel is Mission Devrai at uh, gmail.com. Mission Devrai at gmail.com. You can write to us. Thank you. Thank you, Shankar, sir. Ajit, bhai, can I say something? Yeah, although yes. the earth week yes. is, although the earth week is over the activities and the spirit should continue throughout the year until we come to the next earth week right it's not just during the week so let's do it every month Correct. With some activities right? yes, yes yes thank you so much for having me here bye bye yes thank you bye